Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Gluten-Free Chef. I'm your host, Calvin, and I'm here to answer your questions about celiac disease, gluten-free living, and gluten-free eating. To learn more information on how you, too, can live a simple, happy, and healthy gluten-free lifestyle, follow my food blog at theglutenfreechefblog.com or follow me on Twitter at glutenfreechef5 and like me on Facebook at The Gluten Free Chef Blog by Calvin Eaton. We're also found on Stitcher, and you can also review and like this podcast over at iTunes. Let's jump right into this week's episode. Okay, so this week's question is one that I've had on my mind and heart for quite a while, but just had never acted on it. So it's interesting because it's a little different because it's a question that I actually had. And so even though I've been a person with celiac disease for a while, I didn't have the answer to this question. And up until now, hadn't really done any really thorough research on finding a sufficient answer to the question how much gluten can actually make me sick. And it's so funny because all of us have been there, you know, no matter how diligent we try to be or how steadfast we are to making sure that we're we're guarding ourselves against being cross-contaminated or, you know, looking at ingredients and analyzing what's in a particular food product or whatever, there is going to be that time when you inadvertently ingest gluten or something that's you know made with wheat flour and you probably didn't know it or maybe you ate something that somebody else prepared and they didn't know it and you only find out later after your stomach or whatever your symptoms may be when you ingest gluten starts flaring up and you feel like oh my goodness like what was in that how much gluten was in that and so that begs the question then how much gluten actually does make you sick. And like I've mentioned, this is a question that I had up until now, but I hadn't really done any thorough research on it. So what I did was I, of course, went to my trusty friend Google, and I put in the the question, how much gluten can make you sick? And I found a really nice article that I thought I'd share with all of you. So this podcast is great for those of us who have been celiac for several years, and also those who may be newly diagnosed who have, an, who, who have this question or want to know this question, how much gluten can actually make you sick. And it's, it's so funny because the first line in the article has pretty much been the line that has been the beginning line to all of the questions we've discussed thus far on the podcast, is that, you know, simply speaking, it depends. You know, it depends on the person and it depends on many different factors, um, actually how much gluten can make a person sick. And that's because all of us, you know, dealing with celiac disease or gluten sensitivities or gluten intolerances, we have different thresholds for intolerances and sensitivity levels when it comes to cross-contamination and actually ingesting gluten itself. And it also depends on whether a person has one-time exposure or whether they're ingesting maybe a little bit of gluten each and every day, so over time. So just to put it out there, you know, the the simple answer is that it really depends on the person. And of course, we know that those of us who have had celiac disease for some time, we know that ingesting gluten is no joke. It's no laughing matter. It's not it's not something to just be brushed brushed over or swept under the rug. It's actually really important that we don't ingest it regularly, and that's why we all take such precaution to make sure that we're not ingesting gluten. And so what I liked about the article is that it kind of breaks it out, and it, it talks about, you know, the, the, the one main um, section of the article, which is found on about.com, and what I'll do is I'll put the, the link to this article in the podcast notes. But so when we say what's well, a small amount of gluten, because all of this is so relative in it, 
really for me reading this article, I said, okay, I need some some numbers. I need some a standard, a threshold. And so according to this article on about.com, celiac.about.com, um, small amounts of gluten are, you know, 50 milligrams or less. In, I guess just to put it into perspective and give you some kind of a threshold, 50 milligrams of gluten would be about 170th of a slice of bread. So let's say if you ate 170th of a slice of bread one time, you you may not or probably would not have a, a reaction to that. But let's say that you're eating that same 170th of a slice of bread every single day for months that small amount of gluten, of course, is going to build up in your system and over time do damage to your intestine. And this research is really backed by Dr. Um, Fasano, who is the head of the University of Maryland Center for Celiac Research. So he did actually did a study on gluten levels and how much gluten actually causes a reaction in people's bodies. And he found that people who consume... 50 milligrams of gluten each day um, had their their villi start to atrophy after 90 days, while those who consume gluten or, or, or 10 milligrams of gluten each day did not really have significant damage. So to put that in some layman's terms, ter- layman's terms that basically means that just a small amount, maybe 10 milligrams or less than 50 milligrams of gluten at one time, you probably don't have to you know, have a have a fit because you ingested such a small amount of gluten. You 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 can probably pretty much assume that if you've ingested just one a single time such a small tiny amount of gluten that you're not gonna you're not gonna kill your gut. You're not going to have a severe reaction unless you're someone who's extremely sensitive, which there are people who are extremely sensitive even to the point of having a gluten-free piece of bread that shares the same toaster as a toaster that uses or toast bread that has gluten, you might have a reaction. But um, the average person who has celiac disease would not have a a negative or adverse reaction to um, ingesting such a small or minute amount of gluten one time. Now, if you're ingesting that amount over 90 days, that's when you're going to begin to see that intestinal damage and that damage to the, to, the, to the intestinal lining, so to speak. Um, additionally, he found in that study that most people with celiac disease can handle up to 10 milligrams of gluten, which 10 milligrams of gluten, according to this article, is the equivalent of one-eighth of a teaspoon of flour. So I'll repeat that. 10 milligrams of gluten is equivalent to one-eighth of a teaspoon of flour, so, putting that into perspective, you're looking, thinking about a teaspoon of flour, one-eighth of that teaspoon would be 10 milligrams of gluten. And so, most of us who had such a small amount would not have a significant adverse reaction to it, except if you th- were thinking that you were going to be ingesting that every single day over time, over several months, over 90 days, then you might want to have some concern to that. So to kind of summarize this piece of it, a one-time single incident of ingesting a tiny amount of gluten is not going to be the end of the road for you. But if you're somehow inadvertently ingesting a small amount of gluten over several weeks, then you you would have you would have some cause for concern. Definitely. Let's move along here. So the article talks about that, obviously, you know, and this is something that I've shared on the previous podcast, it's really impossible to be 100% gluten-free just, you know, because of the processed food world and even, you know, no matter how diligent we are, no matter how diligent companies are, you know, it's almost impossible to be 100% gluten-free because even products labeled as gluten-free and even products that are processed in facilities and they take proper precaution to um, avoid cross-contamination, using separate equipment. Um, Gluten-free bread, cereals, waffles, and crackers do, when they're tested at the molecular level, 
oftentimes do contain small, minute amounts of gluten. Um, now, with that being said, you don't have to be, like, super paranoid and, you know, to the point where you're driving yourself crazy or up all night, but just, just know that it's almost impossible to have a 100% gluten-free um, product in general. Um, and this article really speaks to that and backs, backs that up. And that's why the FDA came to the conclusion that for very sensitive people, intestinal damage begins at four, um, four tenths of milligrams of gluten per day, which would be one two hundredths of a teaspoon of flour. And symptoms began at 15 thousandths milligram of gluten per day, which would be one five hundredths of a teaspoon of flour. Those figures, those, those, those standards are for people who would be extremely sensitive. So that's not for the average person. And what that's saying is that even gluten-free foods contain those like one or four tenths or four one hundredths of a milligram of gluten in them. And for most of us, we would not have a severe reaction to a product that had that trace amount of gluten in them. And the FDA set that threshold understanding that even products that are listed as gluten-free could potentially have trace amounts of gluten in them. No product is 100% gluten-free. And so for, for most companies, most processed foods, and when you look at the back of it, they will say, for instance, this product is naturally gluten-free, but it might have a disclaimer that says this product um, is processed in a facility that processes wheat, nuts, dairy, just so that you, for your own peace of mind, know that if you are extremely sensitive, this product was not produced in a facility that's solely gluten-free. So that disclaimer is there to tell you that there may be a trace amount of gluten in this product. And if you are severely sensitive, perhaps you'll stay away from this food because you might get contaminated. And that's why people who are extremely sensitive to this level they tend to not eat out and to not eat processed foods. I do know people who, because they're extremely sensitive, they choose not to eat out. They prepare all their own food, and many of them do not eat processed foods at all because they're extremely sensitive to even those trace amounts of gluten. Um, this is interesting to talk about because there are people who, who, who have celiac disease who are asymptomatic, which means that some people who get that celiac that panel, that test done, that biopsy done, they've been ingesting gluten for many, many years and they have no symptoms. I know of people who they only got tested because they had a family member that, that, that ended up having celiac disease. And usually when that happens, everyone in that family might get tested just as a precaution. And they may not have been experiencing any, any symptoms. They may not have been having any kind of, um, irritable bowel or um, constipation or diarrhea or anything or rashes or you know sometimes people break out in little tiny little hives when they ingest gluten they may not have any of those symptoms yet they still when they have a test done find out that they do actually have celiac disease those people are considered asymptomatic and then you have people who are on the complete opposite side of that spectrum who any type of small minute contamination or um anything like that, they do get, they have a sense that they have a reaction to it. So because you have such a dichotomy of, of symptoms and reactions, it can be hard to tell. I think that the best thing for you to do is to really learn your body, know your body, know your triggers. If you've, if you've had a product that's been listed as gluten-free and it, it made you sick or you think it made you sick, you might want to stay away from that product. Um, even if you don't, if you even if you are someone who is not extremely sensitive when it comes to like cross contamination, for instance, if French fries were fried in the fryer that fried tater tots that contained a coating of gluten, you may be able to still eat those French fries. That's that's kind of how I am. I'm not extremely sensitive when it comes to just those the cross contamination arena. But what what happens with me is that. If I'm ingesting even those small amounts of gluten over time and the gluten builds up in my system over several days or several weeks, that's when you begin to see the symptoms. 
I still have to be very careful that I'm not ingesting even small amounts every single day. And for the most part, I know that I'm not, but there have been times when I've ingested something that um, I learned later contain gluten and I'm not, you know, I'm not completely devastated by that because I know my body and I know that I, I did, I'm not going to have an extreme reaction right then and there, but I'm very careful because I don't want to keep doing that over time because again, that, that buildup happens over time. And over time, if you, if you're having those small trace amounts, they can begin to re-damage my, my intestinal tract, etc. So let's just kind of sum all of this up. What does this mean? Basically, most people will not react or have a severe reaction to small trace amounts of gluten. People who are doing well in the gluten-free diet may be able to handle eating normal amounts of gluten-free labeled food, even though they contain trace amounts of gluten without any type of symptoms or intestinal damage. People who continue to have symptoms and whose intestinal damage has not healed completely, despite being careful and and really adhering to a strict gluten-free diet, may need to drop potential sources of trace gluten from their diets, and that includes products that are labeled gluten-free. Again, going back to some people, some people who are extremely sensitive may have to stop eating processed foods. That, that, that's cereals, that's oatmeal, that's any type of, you know, even like cookies and potato chips or pretzels, even those that are gluten-free because of their extreme sensitivity. Um, I know that this is a lot of information in the podcast this week, and I know that you know, um, all of these facts and figures may be a lot to kind of take in all at once. Definitely replay the podcast and kind of really, really meditate on what was discussed. Um, for most of us, you know, it's not perfect every day. Like I said, for all of us, you're going to, you're going to, at some point in your journey of being gluten-free and having celiac disease, encounter a situation where you have no choice but to eat something that might contain gluten. I know when I was first diagnosed, I was I took great precaution almost sometimes like I felt like I was being fanatical about it because I didn't want to continue to hurt my gut and damage my intestine. And I used to sometimes get very scared, like, okay, I hope that I did not just ingest gluten because maybe, you know, sometimes I stayed up all night just worrying about what might happen. I'm not, I'm not at that level any longer, but at the same time, I do try to take great precaution to not ingest trace amounts of gluten on a regular basis, but there will be some times when you might have to eat something that does contain wheat on a small amount, and just know that if that does happen, it's not the end of the road for you, and what I found that people have different strategies for what they do when they are inadvertently glutened, as we call it, or they inadvertently ingest wheat or gluten. So that's going to wrap up this week's podcast. I think what will be really helpful is that the next podcast, on next week's episode, I want to talk about what to do when you are gluten because I think that there's a really close relation to these two questions. So, you know, how much gluten can actually make me sick? And then when I I do ingest wheat or gluten, even inadvertently, what do I do? You know, what, what, what steps do I need to take? to kind of start to detox my body and to get the gluten out of my system so that it does not build up and that I don't have, you know, sustained or long-term damage to my, my intestinal tract. So I'm thinking that that will be the question that we'll answer and consider on next week's podcast. If you have any more information on, you know, how much gluten makes a person sick and you want to kind of dig a little deeper into some of these facts and figures, definitely go to celiacdataabout.com, which is a great source of information for those of us who have had celiac disease for a long time and for those of us who might be newly diagnosed. You can also find more information on um, topics like this on my food blog, theglutenfreechefblog.com. Another great site is Lynn's Kitchen Adventures and and also Elena's Pantry, which I've um, supported a lot in my podcast. These are blogs that I just um, really think do very well in keeping gluten-free lifestyle and answering gluten-free questions very in, in a simple manner and in a clear manner and in a way that you can understand so that you can continue to have a safe and happy gluten-free journey. For more questions just about the podcast or more questions that you would like to have considered and discussed in an episode, you can always email me at axaglutenfreechef at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at hashtag AxTheGlutenFreeChef, handle at GlutenFreeChef5. 
And you can also find me on Facebook where I post different articles and questions that I feel do a great job at answering many gluten-free questions at the Gluten-Free Chef blog by Calvin Eaton on Facebook. And I look forward to next week. I look forward to next week. I look forward to next week's podcast.